Welcome everyone. Uh, this is an event we've been looking forward to for a long time. I'm Anne Marie Slaughter. I'm the CEO of New America, and I have the enormous pleasure uh, of hosting the president of New America and the vice president of New America, Tyra Bariani and Cecilia Munoz. Uh, so welcome to Cocktails and Conversation on the occasion of the publication of More Than Ready, uh, Cecilia's wonderful uh, new book, Be You, Be Strong, uh, and Other Stories for Women of Color. Uh, I, we do invite you to grab whatever drink suits you. Uh, if it's a cocktail, if you're on the East Coast, maybe not on the West Coast, a mocktail, whatever you would like, but we do hope you'll participate in the conversation. So I'm gonna start by just saying what everybody in the audience knows about Cecilia Munoz, which is, she would much rather talk about other people than herself. <laughs> she would much rather promote and help other people than put herself forward. So given that that's what we know about you and given that's what so many of us love about you, why did you write a book about yourself? <laughs> well, um, so thank you everybody for being here. This is amazing and thanks Anne-Marie and Tyra. Um, I didn't set out to write a book, and certainly not a book about myself. When I left the White House, um, I did what I think, frankly, a lot of, or certainly women do, which is I found wonderful work at New America that I hoped would be good for the world, and I kind of kept my head down and focused on that work. But a number of people, women in particular, challenged me, and Marie, you were one of them, to think about whether I had something to say that might be of value. And I did, you know, what, what we do. I thought, well, like, what do I really have to say that would really make any difference to anybody? And I kind of put it out of my mind, but, but I got pushed. Um, and that forced me to really think about it. Like, what, well, what do I have to say and who might I have to say it to? And then I realized, you know, I, I do a lot of public speaking. I speak uh, on policy issues. I speak to student groups. I speak to groups of interns all the time. And I tell stories from the course of my career all the time. And I tell the same stories because they're, they're the things that resonate. And invariably, someone comes up to me when I'm done. And 100% of the time, that person is a woman. And most of the time, that woman is a woman of color. And she says to me, that thing that you said, I'm so glad you said that because I thought I was the only one. Um, and so I kind of put myself in the presence of those women, and there've been a lot of them over the years, and realized that I do have something to say, and I say it all the time. And the minute I gave myself permission to believe that I had something to contribute that might be of use, I immediately knew what was gonna be in all 10 chapters of the book. Um, and I spoke to seven awesome women, Tyra Mariani is one of them, um, also women of color who had stories to tell, and kind of learned that the, some of the stuff I have struggled with over 30 years is the same stuff that everybody else struggles with. But we often don't talk about it. We often think it shows signs of weakness rather than strength. And I've learned, I think that's just wrong. And in fact, we are leaders already, women and certainly women of color. And the world kind of needs us right now. So the book is really an offering um, of stories from my own experience, stories from the experience of the women who were generous enough to share their stories. But it's also strategies that we use when we doubt ourselves, when we are aware that people around us doubt us, uh, when we're afraid. Um, so the idea is, is to kind of remind all of us, we've, are, we've got what it takes. And the world is not only ready for what we bring, but we're kind of ready to bring it. So I'm going to invite Tyra to join the conversation. But I, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, who is listening to us, uh, Cecilia is now the Vice President uh, for Public Interest Technology and Local Initiatives here at New America, but she came to us uh, after being the uh, head of the Domestic Policy Council uh, in the Obama White House, which is the highest domestic policy position uh, there is in the White House, and in some ways in all the government. It's, it's not a cabinet position, but you have your finger on the pulse of everything that is happening. Uh, and before that, she had spent 20 years uh, working on, on uh, policy at La Raza uh, and now Unidos. And she, uh, she would never want me to say this, but she won of what we always talk about as a MacArthur Genius Award. So I'm embarrassing her because <laughs> I'm pretty certain that there are people out there uh, who think 
nobody with that kind of a glittering resume could ever have doubts, right? That we all look at each other and we think, no, no, you are a hundred percent secure. It is I uh, who are worried, uh, do I belong here? So Tyra, you're nodding. I'm gonna invite you to join the conversation and maybe talk about what it was like to do, you know, Cecilia, uh, interviewed you, uh, your colleagues, your friends, but you're also women of color who've made their way. So maybe talk about that for a bit. Yeah, it was, um, it was affirming, I think, as much as anything else, because Cecilia would ask me questions. We, she talks about the things that we do to compensate for the underestimation or knowing that people are doubting us and wondering if we're only there for ethnicity. And I told the story of uh, of putting on makeup when I was in my 20s and I went to work at Chicago Public School. Lots of the folks had been there for decades. And I know that I look younger than I actually am. And at the time I really was young. And so I thought I'm gonna wear makeup to make myself look more mature. And Cecilia and I, you know, she said, what about heels? I'm like, yes, heels. <laughs> so, so it was, it was extremely affirming, and as I read the book and read that, I loved reading not only Cecilia's story, but the other women's story as well. But in sharing that, she and I really connected on a, on a, on a deeper level than we already shared as women of color. And again, the stories were, were so affirming as part of this process. And there were some of the stories that the other women here are outrageous. Like my eyes literally got big at some of the the obstacles and the doubts that they encountered. So, but, but again, more than anything, it was like, yes, me too. <laughs> I didn't do that, you know? So I wish I was Cecilia elbow, elbowing my way in some of the other things that she's done. They're really smart strategies. So that's actually a story, Cecilia, uh, you might want to tell that you're marvelous about having to elbow your way in uh, on the advice of your own mentors, right? Yes. And so other people, uh, helped you. So you might want to tell that story. Yeah, so this wasn't a figurative elbow. There's a section of the book that's called Sharp Elbows and Other Tools. And um, the story is from when I first got to Washington, I was all of 26 um, and got thrown into a circle of the people who were advocates on immigration policy in particular, who were pretty much all men. And, for them, and most of them were tall men and my um, immediate boss, who's a wonderful man, who's still at Unidos U.S., called Charles Kamasaki, um, had been one of the guys, and he stepped away from his role and kind of pushed me in. And there I was with the guys. And, you know, I'm 5'2". Uh, I was 26 years old. I actually recount that I took up swearing, actually, on purpose, which is not something I was raised to do, to compensate for my size and my soft-spokenness, I, I thought, I, like, I need to show these people I can be tough. So I deliberately started swearing. Um, I thought it's not a strategy I recommend necessarily, but it's just true. Um, and there was one point where we were working on an immigration bill, and they, we were, you know, in the congressional markup, which is where a bill gets amended and changed, and it ended, and the guys stood up, and they formed a little huddle. And I wasn't in the huddle. And I was angry about it. And I went back and I talked to Charles and I was like, you know, I'm just never going to fit in with these guys. And he said, look, you're new, you're short, you're a woman, like you just got to elbow your way in and just literally just use your elbow and say, guys, come on, can you let me in the circle here? Which, which I did, but I only had to do it once. Um, but that's sort of what it was like. And, and the over and over again, I find that I, I'm still frequently the only woman in the room, the only Hispanic person in the room, the only person of color in a room. I know, Tyra, that's true for you. It's true of the other woman that I spoke to. Um, and, you know, hopefully, like, an elbow isn't a strategy that you're going to need to use terribly often. But we do need strategies. And I think it helps that we talk about it because it's not easy to be the one person kind of speaking for everybody, which in some ways is an impossibility. I mean, Tyra, you had a story about someone who spoke to you who said that they feel their blackness all the time. Yeah, a, a, a high school student actually in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, we, we went there as part of the administration to talk to the students about what was happening there. And she did describe that. And she said, I feel my blackness all the time. 
and I just, I obviously that stuck with me. It's been several years ago. And I, and I thought it's true. It is true, both as, as the joy that comes with that, but then also the challenges of folks underestimating you and doubting you or having preconceptions about you. And so you carry that weight and that weight comes with responsibility. And, uh, and we have to own that, that that is something that is unique to our experience. Just for, I, I want to ask you actually to talk a little more about being underestimated because part of this book is about how we underestimate ourselves, right? How we think we are imposters, how we are constantly worried that everybody else knows what they're doing and we don't. But there's also that the feeling of, I want you to talk about when you know that others are underestimating you. But I do have to just point out the intersectionality here because when you talk about um, you know, I feel my blackness all the time. Most of the time I'm aware I'm a, I'm a woman, not all, not always. And as I've gotten higher up, I mean, I, if I walk into a new America meeting, I don't feel like, oh my gosh, I'm a woman in a man's world, but I've certainly felt it often, but I've never had, but I'm also the majority. Uh, and so I've never had that double sense of, I am a woman, I'm a woman of color and people don't see me at all or they have, they, they're making all sorts of assumptions. So I just, I, I think that's part, there's part of what you talk about Cecilia that's true for all women and then there's definitely part that is, that is particularly relevant for women of color. But Tyra, you might want to talk about when, what you do when you feel like people are underestimating you, when you can feel that sort of um, I think it's George W. Bush that called it the, the bigotry of low expectations. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I wear a shirt. <laughs> I know, I love it. If people can't see it, it says underrepresented, underestimated. <laughs> but I do, right? I think there is something in the, in the explicit of saying, I know what you're, you're potentially thinking. You can't assume that for everyone, but I mentioned, for example, even wearing this shirt and in an all staff meeting, it was an all staff meeting where we were talking about our diversity and I wanted, I wanted to just to make that point without saying it, but in wearing it and I could tell that I saw, I remember seeing some of the women, in a co women of color in the room and their faces lit up. I could tell when they had read my shirt. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> It, it was my way of saying, this is what I think people think about me. And this is what I know that people think about us and whatever the other and the only in the room is, whether it's African Americans or Latinx or women of color more broadly or women in the case, not at New America, because we're 70% of the workforce uh, mm -hmm. there, but in general to say, this is this is this lived experience and I see you and I want to create space for you to show up in, in the workplace to be who you are. And I do that in part through my, through my clothing. I've mentioned that I wear, you know, African clothing. Sometimes I'll wear mud cloth skirts and, and printed fabrics of color that you just don't see a lot in painting. <laughs> 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 because it's expression, but I want to create space. I grew up, uh, you know, my early years were in a corporate environment and I didn't, there weren't women, it, I don't have the luxury now, but there weren't women with platinum hair. There weren't women who were wearing printed fabrics, but I want people to show up the way that, that they want to express themselves, obviously professional and all that, but there's, there's plenty of room that we don't exercise as part of it. But the other thing that I do in terms of the underestimation is, is the preparedness. Because uh -huh. even though I know that I am, and, and Cecilia and I remember sharing about this as well, that you know that you're competent and you're skilled, but you want to make sure that you take out any margin of error of having a bad day by being prepared. So we tend to over-prepare, yeah. knowing to sort of say, I'm going to show you. And I have been invited to spaces and places and conversations knowing that it probably is because I can check the diversity box for the person. And I show up saying, you may have invited me for this reason, but I'm going to show you how much more I can contribute to the conversation as part of it. So uh, in some ways I'm looking to overperform, if you will, just to, to, to prove that what I know is an underestimation to have been a, a, false, a false attribution. 
So Cecilia, why did you call your book More Than Ready? <laughs> well, it has, I mean, it's a, I, it's a wonderful title, I, and I had help from my editor in picking it out. Has it really, it refers to that, but it refers to multiple things. I mean, I think the world is kind of more than ready for what we bring. Um, and we're more than ready to bring it. But, but also it refers to exactly what Tyra said. All seven of the women that I spoke to landed on the same strategy, which is that when we are concerned about, when we are, are like not quite sure that we've got what it takes, then we, what we do is we over-prepare. Um, and when we sense that other people may doubt that we have what it takes, what we do is we over-prepare. Like we do the work, we show up knowing our stuff. And that is, we kind of lean back into that and that gives us the strength to compensate for whatever doubts we have or whatever doubts we think other people have. And, you know, one of the stories I tell in the book um, is, it has to do with a, a time when one of the chiefs of staff that I served under um, told a couple of folks who were writing books that um, when I was promoted to, to domestic policy director, that, that for, he described it as the last straw leading to his departure from the White House. Um, and the, I don't think he said it in so many words, but the impression that the two people who wrote books that he said that to, the impression that they got was that maybe I was less qualified, maybe I was an affirmative action hire. And because I saw those books, um, that cost me probably about two years of self-confidence in the time that I was at the White House. Um, not because I thought that I couldn't do the job, because I was in the job. I was doing the job and the President of the United States had asked me to do the job. And I was in that job for five years. Um, but because I did think, well, if, that, if that's what that one person, well, obviously a very prominent person, felt, how do I know that that's not what everybody in the room is thinking when I'm sitting here? And how do I know if I'm having a bad day or I, you know, boned up on this set of stuff, but the thing that blew up that day was this set of stuff that I wasn't quite ready for. Um, you know, I don't want that, uh, uh, their impression of that to be, yeah, well, you know, we need, we need to surround this person with other people who can carry the water because we're not sure that she can. And the thing about a place like the White House is that when, folks sense that you're not quite on your game. They don't tell you, like you don't get feedback unless you ask for it and maybe even not then. They just kind of organize meetings without you. So yeah. your radar is constantly going for are like people, is there a meeting happening that I'm not in and what does it mean? And like you, you can really do a number on yourself. Um, and I learned and this, I, I, I learned from talking to other people, it's not just me that this happens to. Um, that the way you compensate for that is you make good and sure you're doing a really good job. You make good and sure you do your homework. Um, you know, you make good and sure you're prepared. And then when you invariably have to answer a question that you don't know the answer to, because sometimes it happens, you own it up and you go find out. Um, and I, I think that's very much part of the strategy that, that, that we adopt. We, um, Kathy Cochin, who I think is, I can see on the chat, I think she's participating. She's one of the women that I spoke to. She called it being ultra prepared. Disha Dyer, who I also see, who's one of the women that I spoke to, who I also see in the chat, same thing. She was somebody who was thought of, she was the social secretary to the president and the first lady, which is an incredible high pressure job. She was viewed as an unconventional choice for that job because the people who get picked for that jobs are, you know, kind of have like the Emily Post pedigree. Um, and what she had was smarts and skill and creativity. She's, she's amazing. But, you know, the press was watching her because she's somebody who didn't fit their image of who's supposed to operate in that job. And that happens to people of color, happens to women all the time. And the way we deal with it is we show up, you know, with some extra. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think every woman uh, has probably had that experience of worrying or, or feeling like they're, they are being either invisible or underestimated uh, or just, you know, the not heard so often. Uh, and a fair number of us have probably also felt like there are men around us who think we're an affirmative action hire you know, that we're there because we're a woman. And Tyra, when you said, you know, all of us have had the experience of knowing that we're on a panel or in a, or, you know, in a commit on a commission or on a board because of our gender more and more than our, uh, our qualifications. Um, but 
I, I do think the, um, you know, again, when I look at women of color, this has become almost reflexive as somebody who hires people. I immediately assume they've got something extra because how else would they have made it this far? Right? I, it, to me, it's flipping the script. It's looking at people and thinking, I know what was, you know, how the cards were stacked against you. So if you even got to the point that you could be considered to be promoted, that's because you, you had the grit and the determination and the preparation and the sheer smarts to make it. So it's, I really, th I often wish I could give people different lenses to understand what it takes to battle not only your own self-doubt, but also that pressure on you and coming at you from society all the, all the time. You know, Justice Sotomayor uh, talks about this in her, she wrote a wonderful book called My Beloved World, and she talks about how she knows she got to Princeton through affirmative action, but she describes that as, okay, so that got me to the starting line of a race I didn't even know I was running. So you get to the starting line, but then you know what, you have to run the race, right? You have to show up, you have to be prepared, you have to do it well. No, you know, nobody's gonna let you take shortcuts. Um, and that's, that's what we have to do. And, and often it is against the headwinds of people's low expectations of us. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And people do feel like, Tyra, please. I was gonna say, to that point, I, I love that metaphor because I, I, in our conversation, I described that, you know, I had this incident where my confidence was, was knocked and it was knocked for years. And the successes that I had after that I thought were more about luck than it was about my preparedness or my competency and skill that I brought. Like it's these three things, but it's, but luck any moment now, my luck is going to run out. And then I came to realize it's not, that's, I had the wrong mix that a, it's not about luck. It's about opportunity. You need, you do need to have opportunity. You need to be able to get to the starting line but it's as much about I'm here because of my competence, because I have prepared as part of that. But when you get those, those knocks in your career, it can be tempting or, or those doubts and not wanting to prove anyone right about those doubts. Uh, you can, you can just sort of get the, get the narrative wrong in your head that doesn't allow you to show up as fully and as with as much power as you bring to the table. And to say, do you feel like you are also carrying other expectations on your shoulders? The expect, in other words, that you are, rep you are, you are the, the, the very high position in the White House as a Latina. Do you feel like you're also carrying the kind of hopes uh, and, and um, expectations and, um, reputation of, of other people on your shoulders, all the Latinos who will come after you, all the people of color, period? I mean, does, is that a, a burden that you feel? Yeah, I mean, several of the people I spoke to described it as a, as it's like weight that you carry. Um, and the way I experienced it is I really, if I'm the first Hispanic person in this role, in this job, I better not screw it up because then it's gonna be that much harder for whoever comes after me. And so, like, I was the, the senior most uh, Latinx person in the White House. And so, and, and that's also my expertise. Like I know the community really well. I was at the National Council of La Raza now, Unidos US for 20 years. Like that's a thing I know a lot about. So I was carrying the community's water along with lots of other people on the team. I described them in the book called Team, team Latino, which you know was an amazing group of people. There were a lot of us, but we had to kind of carry the water and there is this, tension that I feel all the time, which is, and I never understood whether I got the balance right or not, where sometimes your job is to push that, you know, there are folks who don't necessarily know what you know. And in order to do the job well, your piece of knowledge has to be part of the equation and you have to push and insert it. But sometimes your job is to actually hold back a little bit because um, you're your job isn't to be an advocate 100% of the time. Your job is to make sure that the whole team serves the whole country well. And if you are only understood as, well, she's a Latina in the room and she's gonna lift up her stuff and like, you know, we have to let her have her five minutes of, of talking and then we're gonna go on and do our thing. You're not being effective that way either. So you both have to represent 
You have to calibrate it right so that people can hear you. You have to figure out which are the times when they just, there's a thing they just don't know and it's going to be uncomfortable for them to know it, but I got to say it. And which are the times when you're pushing too hard. And so it's like a constant, constant calibration. But there is this sense if you screw it up, it's going to make it, it's going to be harder for the next person who comes after you. But the other thing we tried to be, tried to do, and this was really an example that was set by the president himself, but also by people like Valerie Jarrett, who was really amazing about this, um, is to try to create safe space for people mm. to ask for feedback, to, um, you know, to, to up their game and to, to kind of do that calibration. So I would, rec and this is one of the strategies, it's one of the things I outline in the book, is to find, and I, I just, I had a conversation just this weekend with an, another Latina who was looking for advice, and this was the advice I gave her, was to find people who see you at it and who um, are safe enough that you can go in and close the door and say, how did that go? Or that didn't go well, help me see where I got off course. Uh, Valerie was that was one of those safe places for me. There aren't a lot of safe places in a job like that, but she provided one of them and you could go in her office and close the door and say, you know, how do I, I'm not being understood in this point I'm trying to make, or, you know, I can't tell how others are receiving me. And, you know, she, she was both committed to her colleagues, but also committed to making sure we were doing the job well and you get feedback, even if it was hard to hear. Um, so that's one of the strategies I recommend is be relentless in asking for feedback, but find people who you can trust to give it honestly and who won't hold it against you that you're asking, right? Some, for some, some people see that as a sign of weakness. I actually think it's a sign of strength. You're saying, look, I'm trying to up my game. Give me information that I need to do it. Um, but it's not always safe to do. So it's important to, to figure out who you're, who your team is. And, and it was important to me. I didn't, so Valerie w was my boss the first three years. Um, but I didn't just ask for feedback from the people that I um, reported to. I also asked for feedback from the people who reported to me. And that was really, really important in making sure that I, that I did a good job. Uh, Tyra, you, you were uh, nodding. So Tyra was the uh, Deputy Chief of Staff uh, for the Department of Education. So Arnie Duncan was the Secretary of Education and Jim Shelton was the Deputy Secretary and you were Jim's Chief of Staff. But you were, you were pretty high up there. Are there people you ask for feedback from? It's Jim and I shared that for sure. And Chief of Staff, Emma Badir, we also did that. But yeah, there, I, and, and the three of us do that, right? That's what makes this... <laughs> special for good and for bad you know that I will give you feedback <laughs> and, uh, and Cecilia and I will talk and go how did that go and the three of us do that together that is the the beauty of working at New America is, is the opportunity to, to work with the two of you because it never ever stops and there's a saying that the higher you go the less you hear mm -hmm. the less you hear what's going on within the organization so it it is critical at all stages of one's career but it's even more critical within a senior leadership role and so yeah it you know jim still asked me for feedback today because he knows i'm going to give it to him straight and then he can count on it and you have to look for those people because people will tell you what they think you want to hear but it doesn't make you better to hear what, you, what they think you want to hear. And in fact, I'm skeptical of the person who's unable to come up with anything. Like, really? You can't come up with anything? <laughs> Perfect, really? <laughs> it's just, it's not possible. We're human, we're fallible as part of that. So it is, there was a point that I was kind of a, a feedback junkie because I was always looking for the feedback and I had to just rest both with my own sense of self and how I was doing, but to find that close network of people that you know will be honest agents, again, to help you calibrate. And knowing sometimes you, you want to, you have to push, you want to push and you're going to leave people uncomfortable and then what, it maybe it goes too far or maybe you didn't go far enough, but you, you need not only your own calibration, which ultimately I think rests with um, peace within self of whether or not you did that, but then using others around you to that end. 
You know, it's interesting, Tyrus taught me more about feedback. You know, we, we work together in many different ways, but you've taught me more about asking for feedback and giving it. Uh, probably you, um, you, you nominally report to me, but I, I've learned far more about how to actually improve myself from the way you provide me. So you, you were going to jump in, and I, then I have another question for you. So I think the thing that we forget or that we fail to take into account enough, or at least that I have failed to take into account enough, is that um, if, if, if a woman of color is in the room, by almost by definition, there's sort of more perspectives there than, than, the, than the way decisions are traditionally made, certainly on policy issues, certainly in corporate boardrooms, in many, many settings that determine the course of our lives in the United States, those decisions are made frequently by men and frequently by men who are not people of color. Um, and so just by virtue of being in the room, we are bringing something which is too infrequently there. Yeah. And there's reams of evidence now that if you have a diverse group of people from a variety of backgrounds making a decision, that those that, that a diverse group tends to make better decisions, they tend to make, make decisions that are more effective. And this is true in every sector. So the, 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 the thing I advise people, especially people early in their careers, to just know when they walk into the room and they're feeling all of those headwinds that we feel, is that the, the people you're in the room with need you and they need what you bring. They may or may not know that they do, but they do. And it's important that you know that they do because that's one of the places that you will get the confidence to say the hard things that sometimes you, know, that sometimes you need to say or to just hold your own in a setting where you may feel like you're on your own or you may feel people underestimating you. And there's now reams of evidence to support it, but the key is to have that, that kind of at your core as you walk in. Absolutely. So uh, there's a comment in the chat that tees up the next question I was gonna ask you and I, uh, there, many of you are commenting and asking questions and we're gonna to turn to you quite soon. Uh, but Jeannie Gervasi says, one of the things that I think is special about Cecilia is that she comes from a place of kindness and truthfulness and generosity. Uh, and she talks about those, those tools being superpowers, but I wanted to ask you, there's a chapter in the book called Kindness. Uh, and I'm not sure that's what many people would expect. It's certainly, I, you know, I, I read lots of lead corporate leadership books or nonprofit leadership books and kindness this is not exactly the first thing they recommend. So talk about why kindness is in the book. I thought about this long and hard. I mean, it's something, um, and thank you, Ginny, for that lovely comment. Um, Ginny, Ginny herself is an outlier. She's an Episcopal priest. So I think she probably knows a thing or two about being a woman in, a, in an occupation <laughs> typically held by men. Um, kindness is in the book because it is too frequently mistaken for weakness. Mm. And I think that's a mistake, um, right? I talked about how at the beginning of my career, I took up swearing in order to show that I could be tough. Um, uh, and we understand leadership and toughness through a very kind of male lens. Not that men can't be kind, but it's not, kindness is not necessarily a virtue we associate with leadership. And I, but it is a way I try to show up in the world. And I learned that it's a, it's a skill set and it's a skill set that we undervalue and it's a skill set that is tremendously important. So um, the, it, as domestic policy director, part of my job was to drive, help drive the decision making that arrived at the president's desk. Um, I wasn't, I was rarely, I was never the smartest person in the room. I was rarely the person with the most expertise on whatever the issue was that we were discussing. But the skill set that I had that made me good at that job is that I could read a room. I could understand what if you had, as you might imagine, sometimes the Secretary of Labor and the Secretary of Commerce disagree with each other on a policy issue, shocking. Um, my job in that moment was to make sure that each of them got heard and that they were, they, that they felt that if they were in a disagreement on an issue and ultimately the president was gonna to have to decide, they felt that their perspective got heard, it got a fair airing and that he got the information that he needed to have in order to make a tough decision. My like policy brilliance is not, um, is Im maybe important, but in that moment, what the president needs from me is to make sure that the two people who are disagreeing 
can live with whatever decision he makes because they understand that that he had all of the information and he just chose and you know sometimes you win those those decisions or your perspective prevails and sometimes your perspective doesn't prevail but if you think you've been treated fairly and you think the information was present and he just chose a different direction then you can say all right now i'm going to go support that decision i'm going to go make sure that we implement it well because this was a fair process all of that is a skill set that requires empathy and it requires kindness. It requires the ability to understand what somebody needs in the moment in order to get a decision made. And we don't, we think too frequently, especially in, in you know, rough and tumble settings, that the person who's showing up with kindness is, is not showing up with strength, not showing up with tough, toughness, maybe not even showing up with smarts. And when we think that we're wrong, uh, and I have been very inspired by the work of uh, Jennifer Palmieri, my a former colleague who wrote a wonderful book called Dear Madam President. And she's an advocate for like, crying is also okay on the job because it's an expression of emotion. Swearing is an expression of emotion. People do that all the time. So is crying and enough already with assuming we have to behave the way men have behaved for since the, the dawn of time in order to be leaders. Like that's gotten us you know, fairly far, but there are limits. And uh, it's time to reshape what we think leadership looks like. And that includes kindness. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and of course, we also know that men are socialized not to show their emotions. So they, they're given a very narrow range within which they're allowed to express their emotions. Swearing is okay. Crying is certainly not okay. Even, even kind of showing visible emotion and empathy is often not okay. So uh, I agree there, but I think it's particularly important in Washington where very quickly you feel that unless you're cynical and hard boiled and you know, kind of think the worst of people, you're naive and idealist and you know, just kind of not, not tough enough for the game. Whereas in fact, if we're working on behalf of the American people and we are supposed to actually take these values seriously, it doesn't mean we're, we're patsies. We can be plenty tough, but kindness, empathy, emotion, kind of connection to people to me is so important. And a part of what I've, I've, I always find difficult about Washington and certainly parts of the government is that you really are read out if you're not if you're not presenting this hard-boiled, cynical kind of old-school journalist. You know, they're just out for their own uh, perspective. So I, I found that part of your book to be extremely uh, important. Thank you. So, so I, I, my old friend and former colleague Chris Liu is asking a question. Hi, Chris. Uh, whether uh, whether I think men will benefit from reading this book. Well, that was one of my questions. So, Chris, thank you. <laughs> Lovely question. You know, I, I hope the answer to that is yes. I mean, the person, the people in my head as I was writing it were women, and in particular women of color. But um, I think we're important. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it's important for humans, other, you know, people who are not women of color to understand some of what we wrestle with. Um, and to also have an opportunity to rethink what leadership looks like. Um, so I hope it's useful to men. Um, and I hope, I hope people enjoy the book, but most of all, what I hope is that people find it useful. That's, um, that's why I wrote it. I will, I will second that it is definitely useful to men. The men can be kind, the feedback point, we talk about family, all of those things are, are relevant to us as human beings. Uh, so it definitely, I think there's, there are some things that are certainly unique, but, but I think there are some universal principles in there as well. Now, I, I often think of how, how many books I have written by male leaders about leadership, and I've learned from them that they don't always apply in many ways. I think leaders come in many different stripes, but I've certainly read and learned from them. So I can't imagine why men would not equally learn both the experience of men, maybe the women of color around them, but also just for themselves, just thinking about, you know, how to ask for feedback, how to show emotional, all of that I think is, is very valuable. Um, 
So I think we are about ready to turn uh, to questions. Uh, I see one question that actually uh, um, Cecilia Ortire uh, might answer, but it said, did any women you interview have strategies for how to respond to white fragility? So for anybody listening, sort of the idea that it is often uh, that when, when you are raising critiques from the position of a woman of color or a person of color, uh, often white people get very, very defensive. Uh, and so you, you end up kind of having to protect against that. Uh, and so that was a question that uh, says there's a lot of defensiveness that I'm unsure how to navigate. So we didn't address it as a specific topic. Um, and, and, and maybe we should have, because it's a, it's a thing. Um, but, uh, but I, didn't, I didn't ask that question in, in so many terms. I will say that um, everybody that I, that I spoke to feels like they're kind of juggling multiple things. If this came up in my com in conversations with them about kindness, it came up in my conversations with them about kind of sort of feeling like you're representing everybody when you're in the room and that you have kind of multiple identities, one of which includes the person who's listening, who's trying to listen and trying to understand. And there is this sense that um, we are expected to sort of represent as well as to understand, like if we're going to be effective. And this is a, an, an argument that I, I have with my, I have two wonderful adult daughters, a, a, a conversation that, that we're having a lot is that they are kind of less willing to modulate how they present something so that they can be heard. Um, and for them, it's much more about expression and about being true and about being authentic. And I modulate all the time. Um, so I think that's part of the tension. And at least for me, and I can only speak for myself on this, my goal in almost all of those conversations is to bring people along with me. And so that's why I modulate. But I understand and respect that that's not always everybody's goal. That, that was, a, I remember us having that conversation of thinking about impact and the need to modulate in order to have impact and versus like, I'm just gonna say it and you gotta deal with it. And there's people, uh, it, you know, to choose to navigate within one end of the spectrum or somewhere in between. And I'm sure it varies from conversation to conversation as part of that. But there's, there's definitely a piece of, I just need to say it and you have to hear it. And it's on you to own that and deal with it. And I think it also depends on what we're talking about and who's in the room of, of to what degree do you modulate versus like just putting the ball, you know, on the, on the other side of the court and, and having them respond. So Cecilia, there's a question from Sally Osberg, one of our wonderful board members uh, and Sal, that says, I, I love this question. It says, um, everything you say speaks of tremendous dignity on your part. Did you ever lose it? <laughs> There's space for women to demonstrate anger, frustration, and hurt. And Sally read this, led the Skoll Foundation for a long time uh, and certainly was on the front lines of, uh, of, of plenty of underestimation, let's put it that way. But did you ever lose it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, thanks for the question. I. I don't think I ever lost it in a, now I'm going to yell at people way. I, that's kind of, that's, uh, when I lose it, I, it tends to uh, manifest itself in tears. Um, I had one, I think, memorable occasion that um, the summer of 2014 was the summer, what I think of as the summer of unaccompanied kids. It was the crisis of large numbers of children coming from Central America um, uh, alone. And I, I was, you know, a lot of us, there was a team of us in the thick of, um, you know, making sure that we were properly caring for those kids, which it both seems like a long time ago. And my goodness, so much has happened in that realm that I can hardly talk about. Um, but but uh, for a very concentrated period, we were so focused on getting those kids into proper shelter care. And every day I was kind of examining my conscience to make sure that we had done everything we could and, and, and that we were doing the best possible job under the circumstances. And at the same time, the president was being um, getting a lot of pressure from folks in the advocacy community, which the immigration advocacy community, which is a world that I come from, um, on, a, on a variety of things, including immigration enforcement. And there was one meeting in the Roosevelt Room 
where both of those things kind of came to a head and I was sitting next to him and these, you know, people that I love who are like my family are pushing hard on him um, and pushing hard on me, which is their job and which I totally respect, but it was fairly heated. And uh, so I mostly kept it together, but a tear managed to like to roll down my cheek, which everybody evidently noticed. I thought it was very subtle. It was not. Um, so my, um, my losing it tended to manifest itself that way. And I tried not to do it in front of other people. Jen Paul Mary would tell me it's totally fine to do. Uh, I didn't know that at the time. I hadn't observed that at the time. Um, but I did, I think I probably, usually on my way home from work, I cried every day that summer. <laughs> that is helpful. So Cecilia, uh, Ben de Guzman asks, asks a question that, that directly builds on that where it, he says, I mean, you came out of the, the human rights community, 20 years of fighting on behalf of immigrants uh, as a human rights advocate, and you, you found yourself in the middle of really tough, tough, tough decisions, and you were criticized by, by people who, from your community. How did you, I mean, crying on your way home is definitely one way that we all, we all let go in, in different ways. But how did you manage that? I mean, on the one hand, you were representing communities of color. On the other hand, you were representing an administration you were a part of. How, how did you navigate that and learn to live with the criticism? I think. Yeah. So I knew it was going to come. And thanks for the question, Ben. Um, he's, who's a wonderful advocate who I greatly admire. Um, I, I, I knew when I took the job that I would get ripped to shreds in some corners of my own community. And I, I knew that that was true because I would be part of governing and part of governing includes immigration enforcement. And so I understood that when I took the job. And so I felt, I felt emotionally ready for it when it happened. It, was, it got fairly personal. And I, um, I don't think I was quite ready for how personal it got, but, um, but I, understood, I understood it. And look, the job of an advocate is to push the people who are governing. So like, I know that as well as anybody because I did it for so long. Um, the way I grappled with that, the, you know, when you walk into the building on the first day, you hope and believe that you're going to be able to do the very best you can every day. You understand that the tools are not going to be perfect. You're not going to be able to do a perfect job. And the law, especially in the case of immigration, the law is badly broken. So the tools kind of are kind of terrible. Um, but you're going to use the tools in the in the most constructive possible way. And you're going to try to be governed by law and by values. Um, and that's, I decided on that first day that I was going to try to be able to look myself in the mirror every day and believing that I was doing the very best I could with the tools that I had. And it helped a lot that I worked for a president who, whose judgment I really believed in, right? He, I, I felt that he wasn't going to ask me to do anything I didn't believe in. And I was right about that. So, um, I think there's lots of criticisms to level that are really fair. Um, I think there are a fair amount that feel kind of unfair, but that comes with the territory of trying to lead and, and, and of governing. And um, so I, you know, I, I mostly, because I kind of went in understanding that it was going to happen, I mostly, it mostly didn't bother me much. And, but I did learn what I think of as the difference between um, criticism that is about trying to help you to do a better job <laughs> Or that, it, you know, lifting up something that you got to fix because it's broken. Um, and criticism that's about being, just being righteous. Uh, and I have more respect for the former than for the latter, frankly. Yeah. No. Um, I, I, when people ask me about being a leader, one of the things I always say is, if you want to be liked all the time, this is not for you. <laughs> There's just no way to lead effectively meaning you actually make decisions and move things forward and be liked all the time. You hope you can do it in a way that, that minimizes the, the, the dislike or the anger or whatever, but the criticism will come. So Cecilia, we have a question from Helene Gale, whom you know well, who's a New America's board chair. And it may be early for this question, but it says, what is the most unexpected response you have gotten to your book uh, and from whom, although not by name? Not by name. Um, well, the book is only just coming out today, so I, uh, so I haven't had much response yet. Um, but I will say, 
in the, in the course of writing it, I asked my daughters for their input. And I'm in this wonderful position. My daughter's names are Tina and Mira. They're 27 and 24. Um, and one of the things I wrote about was balancing life and work. And I got a chance to ask them, how, you know, how did it go <laughs> from your perspective? And they actually contributed. <laughs> um, and, 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 and at least the response, I, the most interesting response that I got in the course of writing the book really came from them because they didn't understand the question. Like they, I agonized so much about how hard I was working and whether or not I was being the kind of mom that I wanted to be. Um, and they just, they, um, they experienced it very differently. So when I asked them the question and they wrote me back, I was quite startled that like all the agonizing, all, all, just for all the agonizing, they were just, they, for them it was fine. Um, and I, so that surprised me. And um, I try to raise it a lot because I have, it, it, you know, Henry and Tyra and I have a lot of colleagues who are raising kids and right now they're home and they're trying to homeschool and they're trying to work and it's, it's a lot. Um, and so I try to be assertive in saying, you know, you, you may be experiencing this as doing everything halfway. Your kids are experiencing you as a dedicated parent and, and that it feels different from their end than it does from your end. And don't forget, it's like, you know, it's more okay than you think. He has so, a chat, as you know, and I, I have to just, without saying what, you put their responses in the book and it is, it is really beautiful. So if for no other reason to see their responses to your question was, was just a delight. Well, one of those daughters happens to have weighed in on the chat. Uh, so Gina uh, was continuing the, the, your conversation with her and uh, about why your daughters are less willing to modulate, as you put it. Uh, and she says, uh, maybe the issue is their generation that they've had it with having to wait for the rest of the world to get it. And before I, I talk about Tina's uh, response there, one of your daughters, uh, I want to just uh, say uh, Diane Zarzuelo wrote in saying, I am so tired of asking for permission to be my badass self. I feel like I have to manage everyone else's feelings about what I want to say, how I say it, and whether I get to have the authority to say it or do what I feel is right for our, my community. Uh, so she's asking like, how do you create space uh, for powerful, hungry, passionate, strong, and talented women of color? How do you, you allow them to be themselves? Uh, and Tina says uh, that, that, you know, it's really, in, that that's a big part of it, that, the, that you don't want to wait for the rest of the world to get it. Uh, but Tina also says, uh, I just feel so lucky to have a mom who's willing to talk about these kind of tactics and hear where we're coming from when we disagree. So all of that is really lovely. Um, I, so I think we're experiencing a, a really important generational shift. I, I can definitely feel that I'm on the, like, the aged side of this generational shift. Um, but, and, I, and part of this is because um, younger women are less, um, are kind of less willing to put up with stuff that, that the rest of us have put, put up with for a while. And I love that, honestly, and honor and respect it. I, I, I continue to believe that it is important to find ways to bring people along with you. But it also, you know, I say that as a, that's the result of many years of bending myself like a pretzel to be heard and, and understood. And uh, I have some respect for people who are kind of not willing to do all that bending. And I, I, hopefully there is a place in between those things that allows us to be authentically who we are and to insist that people meet us at least part of the way for Pete's sake. And, I, and frankly, there are more of us now, you know? Uh, uh, in, the, in the time that I was working at NCLR, Latinos became the largest minority in the country. And, and I feel really fortunate that in the sort of trajectory of my own career, we went from being completely invisible, except like in the Southwest, in Florida, in New York, and Chicago, to being the largest minority in the country. And we may be a lot of things, but invisible isn't one of them anymore. And, and with that comes the rest of the country kind of having to deal with us. We're here, you know? 
And, and obviously the dynamics are very different in the African-American community because, because of the history. Um, but I, I do think we are arriving at a place where younger people are insisting on being seen in a different way. And thank God. Well, I think you talk, and Amory and I had this conversation too, where I was sharing, I was in a, a cohort where a, an older woman said that her daughters sort of said, it's because of you that we're in this position. And I think she was talking about the Me Too context, but, and the conversation I was having with Amory was also, there is also something about setting the stage and you make this point in the book of movements just taking a really long time that there were things that happened in the 1700s and the 1800s and that then led to, you know, um, women's rights to vote that led to the Civil Rights Act. It, did, it wasn't a five year or 10 year thing. It was a multi-generational thing. So I think we have to also acknowledge how that context is different. I'm, and, I, and I personally find it refreshing that I can have pushback and conversations about diversity that aren't only with people of color or on, aren't only with black people. It is refreshing that I can just speak about it in a way that I didn't think I could 20 or 30 years ago as part of that. And it is because there is this groundswell, there's an intolerance, there's like a movement of people standing behind you that this is part of the conversation and that intolerance uh, or an impatience is the right thing to have as part of this. So I think for me, it's like this, this building, I think you talk, about, I love the metaphor of talking about the ripples and how the ripples themselves lead, eventually lead to what become waves. And I think we also have to acknowledge that part of it as well, but it is that, that juggling that we've been talking about that someone in the chat mentioned, the pretzel, those things, they are absolutely exhausting. And even for myself being, you know, an African American woman in a majority white institution, I am exhausted. <laughs> Navigating and Anne Marie feels this as well. We have that that partnership in that way of the responding to the diversity and trying to manage it all in a way that allows you to be effective. And for me, recognizing, you know, I am in a position of power, yet I know the weight that I carry that comes from and the pushback, depending on what I decide to do, you carry that and you yeah, most days, most days you're tired. <laughs> and that's, that's the challenge of leadership. Mm -hmm. And I'll say it's, it, as I listen to this, I, I think on the one hand, I hear it as a parent where you want to teach your kids what the real world is like. And at the same point in time, you hope that they change it, right? You don't want that to be the world that they encounter, but you also know that you've encountered it. And I often think, uh, when I wrote my article in 2012 about work and family and how tough it was, many, many women have written to me to say, you know, I read your article when I was in college and I thought you were full of it. And now nine years later or six years later or whatever, I've got, I have suddenly had my first child and oh my God, were you right? So they're telling me the world still hasn't changed as much as I want to change it. They thought that it was going to be different, but change is slow. And yet I can also look at that and say, yeah, but the world you're entering is light years better than the world that I entered or, or particularly the women 10 years ahead of me. Mm -hmm. So Cecilia, there's a question on a slightly different um, front that I think is also gonna be interesting uh, to lots of people from Jessica Davidson. Uh, she says, I'm a young woman who started at the Obama White House at the very end and then moved to an anti-sexual violence advocacy. The tools to be a frontline public advocate of a movement uh, and the tools to fit into the old Washington style uh, that we know about are often not complementary. I want to go back and forth between government domestic policy roles and fierce frontline advocacy in the future and wondered about one harming my ability to be taken seriously in the other. So what advice do you have for someone like me uh, who wants to follow you where you've been an advocate and a policymaker uh, and now probably a bit of both. So what a great question. I mean, I think they are, um, I, I wasn't sure the skill set would transfer, the advocacy skill set would transfer into a governing skill set when I, when I walked into the White House on the first day. 
I had doubts about it. And then I discovered that actually they are compatible skill sets that, um, you know, in this case, I was serving a president who knew exactly who I was. So he knew what he was getting. And so I had, I, I drew some confidence from that. But, um, but the skill sets are more related than I thought they were going to be. Um, now, it does require that thing that we talked about before, if, you, if you're moving from being an advocate to governing and back again, there are some people who will not have it, who, you know, who will impose a purity test or a righteousness test or will not accept whatever um, kind of, you know, however imperfectly you use the tools when you're in a governing role that, you know, involve choices that you just don't have to make when you're in an advocacy role. And you, I think you have to be willing to uh, endure that. Um, but, the, but I love the idea of, of going back and forth. I, frankly, I resisted it. I resisted going into government. And I, I'm now so glad that I did. I learned so much. And so much that now informs my approach as an advocate, because I never stopped being an advocate. But wow, it helps to know where the levers are. And it helps to know how the process works. And it helps to know who is the person you need to be poking to try to get them to do the thing you want them to do. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of advocacy is disconnected from strategy about how to move the policy that's actually going to affect people's lives. And so an advocate who understands how that works on the inside is very valuable to the right kind of advocacy campaign and institution. And from the governing perspective, I mean, obviously, you have to pick your, pick your, your boss well, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, work in an administration that wants people who know what you know as an advocate. The, and I, I had that luxury. I wouldn't have done it if it weren't for the fact that this was a president who had been an organizer and who respected organizing and advocacy. Um, but I think of the challenge for someone early in their career as, and, and people who have heard me, who have heard me speak to people early in their career will smile because I say this every single time, it's a continuum. And if like government is on this end of the continuum and organizing is on this end of the continuum and there's lots of things in between, your job is to find where you belong. Like we need good people at every point on that continuum. Um, and I, where I thought I belonged on the continuum when I got my first job turned out to be wrong. And I learned that I was better at something else. But your job is to figure out where your voice is strongest, where you feel like you are a fit, where you are engaged in work that makes your heart sing when you wake up in the morning. And that's, that's the work that you will be effective in doing. Yeah, I think that's a marvelous part of the book where you describe sort of your sense that uh, you should be on the front lines. And Tyra and I were talking about this today at this moment of crisis. Many of us feel like we're just not doing enough. We're sitting in our houses and we're on Zoom calls and we're writing, uh, you know, emails. And you, you write very powerfully about realizing, wait a minute, this is not for me. This is not where I can contribute the most. And that's very important for all of us. We have to accept the gifts we have and how we can contribute, even though we might wish or think that others are, are contributing more. So there's a question from uh, our own Emma Faagawu, who uh, was of us um, and uh, is uh, asking, she says, I'm curious if you have any words about moments of crisis, whether workplace, system, whether workplace systems are likely to revert to the existing or hidden networks that exclude us, uh, where, uh, whether we find it harder to trust ourselves in a crisis, uh, and what advice you have for us. Oh, wow. Emma, for what a wonderful question. Um, you know, we're obviously we're living through a crisis now and you can definitely feel we're all kind of thinking through like, what do we know about anything remotely resembling situations like this? Who are the leaders then? Well, those leaders were men and for almost by definition, if you're, if you're looking back in history. Um, uh, and, and, so, and what were the systems? Like, what are the ways that people made decisions that kept people safe? Um, you revert to those things because those are the paths that have been worn. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, the, um, that those systems were the right ones, that they're appropriate for our current time. And, and, and what we have learned about previous crises is what has come down to us from you know, people who were focusing on, on a certain kind of leadership and not other kinds of leadership. I, I, you know, if you dig into it, um, the, you know, during the Second World War, women were as important to the war effort as men. Of course we were. We've learned much less about that. 
Um, and so we don't, when we think about who is making the decisions and how do the big stuff happen, you know, there's a lot written and a lot that we've learned about at that layer of leadership and much less about what was happening in the realm that women were engaged in. Um, and so I, I, I feel excited that we're living in a time where, where we are kind of reworking those paradigms and beginning to understand leadership in a different way, beginning to recognize people who made an enormous contributions historically, but who weren't recognized, because that teaches us a lot about what we need to know right now in this minute, in this crisis, how to knit a community together, how to you know, make sure that we are watching out for each other, how to make sure that people who are vulnerable get protected, um, and frankly, how to make sure that we, when we're at, during, when we're in this crisis and when we're on the other side of it, that we be that we become a society that that we should be. We're, you know, this crisis is exposing a lot of the ways in which we failed each other as a society. Um, going back to the old way of making decisions and the folks who used to make the decisions is definitely not going to be the way to make the world what we need it to be. Um, so it's a, I think it's a thing to understand, but also a thing to to resist, if that makes sense. So Cecilia, there's a related question from Kathy Bryan, which I find a very interesting given the way we're all working uh, today. She says, do you think the, and to Tyra, to you too, do you think the dynamics of the room or the table will change in an, the online remote environment that so many of us are working in these days? Any advice for elbowing your way in here? And I think that is interesting because suddenly, um, I mean, in some ways, we, everybody can be seen equally because we're all little boxes on a screen. But in other ways, it may be even harder to kind of assert yourself. Be interested in what both of you think. Tara, do you have a view? Yeah, I, well, I will say it's an interesting question. I'm still pondering it. But what I have noticed, at least in our context, is when you... I think the chat box has opened up, has created, has created more space. Mm -hmm. Like whether we're having an all staff or directors, we're having people chime in and participate in ways that have not happened before. It doesn't feel as risky as speaking up and everybody turns their attention. <laughs> right. And so it just feels riskier. And Anne-Marie and I were commenting, like when we do all staff, we're like, there's way more participation in the virtual. <laughs> setting than there ever was when we're holding it in person. So in some ways, I think it is creating space by leveraging some of those tools. But like anything, I think it also has to be intentional on the part of the person that is leading the conversation, as well as I think part of what your book affirms is step in there, because you are more than ready, and you're more powerful than you think. So there's a there's a two-way part to it of the, it's a virtual elbow, I think in some instances that we'll need to see, but I also think the online community has, has created more, the, some of the benefit of the anonymity or seeing everyone at once creates space for, for others to participate as well. But what do you think, Cecilia? I think, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, we're just, we're learning to live in this new world, but I'm quite fascinated I haven't been able to read all the chats as I go through because I'm also trying to concentrate on the conversation, but there's like a whole nother conversation happening on the chat, I've noticed. Yeah, right. Um, which is great. So it's there, you're, you're right, Tyra, that the participation in this kind of new world that we're living in is is shifting in ways that I think are really interesting and, and that um, are lifting up maybe a, a broader diversity of voices than we would typically hear, which is so interesting and kind of exciting. But the piece that's missing to me that I was reflecting on in the last few days is people that I used to see in the kitchen, I don't get to see anymore because I don't, I don't naturally interact with them otherwise. And so I've been thinking about how do I make time to connect in the way that you would at the water cooler, as we used to say back then. <laughs> I don't really have that anymore, but but that's something I've been thinking about are people that I get to connect with and learn from and learn about their experience on any given day. We're missing that part of it. And I think we need to think about how to, how to build that in. I think that's a really interesting point because you don't bump into people virtually. No. 
There's no, no way. And whereas indeed one of the great things about being in the office, if you, if you make yourself available is exactly the water cooler, the coffee machine, uh, you know, those kind of unexpected encounters. So that, that's an interesting point. There, there are a couple more questions, Cecilia, more specifically on your book. And I will say, yes, the, the, the chat is as if people were in, you know, in fifth grade, but they can pass notes to everybody as opposed to just their desk mate. It reminds me of people passing notes in grade school. Uh, but Tamara Richards uh, says, to Cecilia, how do, you how do you address men who talk to you in an angry or dismissive way? Uh, do you adopt a friendly strategy or do you come at them in a similar way? So a very specific question. Um, so uh, I mean, I can think of some examples of times when this has happened. I tend to get really calm and really focused and really um, kind of thorough in my responses, right? So I, I lean right in, in particular, again, I'm small of stature, right? So a, a man getting testy often also involves like size. <laughs> um, and so my defense is to, is to frankly be smarter. Um, and somebody who's being testy is frequently, oh, sorry, that's my landline ringing, is frequently not being smart. Um, and so my, I tend to calm down, get very focused and make sure that I'm like, I have solid reasoning and then I, I kind of lean into the stuff that I know and to express it well, um, rather than trying to um, give, you know, kind of uh, play on the same playing field. Tyra, do you want to, do you have any? Nope. So I'll just say, I, my husband's 6'6", six, six, I've got a son who's 6'5", and another who's 6'3". I'm really used to this. It's, and my strategy is I ask questions. Right? I used to push back, and I'm not just, I'm not just the men in my family, but anybody, I used to push back, and I would very quickly be overpowered. I, 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 assertion is not something you're going to win in that situation. But uh, I just ask questions because I, I have found over time that uh, often first place it puts it back on the other person and often they'll deflate. Uh, so for what it's worth, <laughs> that is the, a, a proven marital strategy anyway. Um, so we have a question here from Rip Rapson, the, uh, you know him well, Cecilia, the, the president of uh, the Kresge Foundation that says Cecilia uh, has, well, actually, I think this is just a comment, but I'm gonna read it. Cecilia has reminded a board on which we both serve that the imperative is to build a machinery of change that may require a long time to build, but that is capable of activating when the time is right. She embodies the kind of fierce and intelligent patience that does indeed change the world. So what a lovely thing to say. Thank you, Rip. <laughs> Offer, offering uh, that. Uh, and then there's a, another question for both of you uh, from A.B. Robinson that says, thank you, Cecilia and Tyra. What is your best advice for uh, a white woman to not only be an ally to people of color, but an accomplice in making change? I think that's an important question uh, for many of us. Well, it's a great question. Um, I think it involves some listening. I think it involves, I, I, in some ways, the best situations like that that I've been in are when people ask, what do you need? What can I do? How can I support you? Um, let me, so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. As you heard Anne-Marie say at the very beginning, I'm like promoting a book that I've written is I find an excruciating experience. I'm, I'm proud of the book, but it feels too much like self-promotion to be in my comfort zone. And one of our very wonderful colleagues, Tara McGinnis, knows me well <laughs> and knows me well enough to know that that's uncomfortable. So she has basically marched into my office to say, I know this is uncomfortable for you and here's things that I think I can do that you're not going to like to do, but that can actually move this forward. Now, that's not necessarily related to race, but it's a strategy. Um, uh, and it helps for me to be able to ask, which I am actually done in this case, but it also helps to anticipate like, here's what I see that I think you might need, but let me check. Um, and, and let me show up in a way that is kind of of service to what you need to move something forward. Tyra, what would you say? 
I do think the listening is part of it and the trust to be open to hearing what we're experiencing or what we're seeing or what we think is inequitable. I've certainly, and Marie and I have had conversations over the years and I think we've worked together close enough. She can see, she'll call it out before I even have to call it out. But I think there's that other piece of the acting, right? The listening and trust are not enough, but the acting is part of it, which is when you're, if you are more aware, when you are in circles that we are not, of course, that you speak out and you say something that you not only observe this thing, but you say something about this thing or you do something about this thing so that it doesn't take us being present in order for the change to happen. So that's that's the other piece I would add to the equation. A great example is recently uh, an invitation to a dinner of scholars, of experts, of policy experts who are focused on poverty. And uh, this was a group of maybe 40 people. And I, I detected, I was one of maybe two people of color in the room. Um, and so one way to be an ally is, is to not expect me to be the one to have to raise it. Like in that situation, we're talking about poverty. We are talking about, you know, communities of color, except that it's a bunch of really wonderful experts who have dedicated their lives to this, but they're all white or almost all white. Um, one way to be an ally is to be the person who lifts that up and not expect the one person of color or one of two people of color to be the ones to say, you know, maybe this room isn't diverse enough to be really authentically talking about this subject that we're talking about. Yeah. That, that reminds me, we were at New America, we were having a conversation around diversity of our events and diversity on our panels, making for richer conversation, better outcomes that you were speaking to earlier. And there was a person, a man in particular, who started making a comment about not really wanting it and seeing it as a quota. And he didn't want it to be a dog and pony show. And I was getting hot. <laughs> I couldn't believe what I was hearing, first of all, but I was also just getting hot. And it was this beautiful moment because the women could relate to Anne Marie's earlier point of having some having some experience with that. And they all just jumped in. It was beautiful for me to feel like, I don't need to jump into this, that other people are allies and they could relate. It was their lived experience as well. So they weren't doing it on my behalf, but it was nice that I didn't have to be one of the few people in the color of the room who was maybe more offended by the comment that was made that was part of it. So that, that just not speaking and saying, can you see, but it, it goes a long way to be able sometimes to even share glances of you caught that comment that was made, right? That was really inappropriate, but that you don't just sit on it. And it's, an, it's great to relate, but we also need to do something about it. And so we got to put all those pieces together. Yeah, I will just say that, that as somebody who spends a lot of time, you know, if a woman makes a comment and it's ignored, and then a man makes the same comment, I'm often the person who will very deliberately say, yes, as Cecilia said, you know, yes, as Tyra said, to remind everybody, wait a minute, the person who really made that comment first was a woman. When a man does that, I could just hug him. You know, when he goes to the trouble of pointing out that actually to, to lift up a woman's voice or to make sure she's heard. Uh, so those things can make a huge difference uh, across, across um, many different situations. Uh, and there's, there's a related question, uh, Cecilia, and actually to all of us, but it says, um, Cecilia, it's from Sharon Burke, and it says, I'm interested in whether um, the three of you and the women you talk to, Cecilia, in your book, uh, felt sometimes the burden of expectations, specifically uh, that they would play a certain part in work life because they are women of color maybe as the social glue, the cheerleader, the nurturer, the confessor. Um, it, that, do you feel, uh, and in particular, uh, as women of color, that you're supposed to play a certain role? I don't, I, I, I'd be interested, Tyron, what you think about this too. It's a great question. I, I, I don't think it's necessarily a certain role, unless it's the, your job is to be the person of color in the room. Like we did, we did talk about that, right? The, 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 then there's a section of the book, which is, you know, when, when you're, you, people, when you feel like you're only there for a little bit of color, right? Where there's a, you know, I, I've been, um, had somebody say to me, 
can you come to this meeting tomorrow? Because we're having this meeting on this thing and we realized that we didn't invite any women or any people of color and you're both. Like, would you come? Um, which is not, I mean, it was, an, I guess, an honest, an honest description of why they were inviting me. But, um, uh, you know, it doesn't actually speak to the whether or not they expected me to actually have wisdom in that meeting, right? So there is that role that all of us have been, and it happens all the time. Um, uh, but I'm not sure that there's a kind, aside from that, that there's a specific role that we all feel like we need to play. Um, it's more that you feel like you're, um, that there's a certain kind of spotlight always on and it never goes off. And you're just aware of it all the time. I, that's how I experience it. I think that's right. I, I certainly, I don't, I don't feel the need to live up to a role at all. <laughs> I'm liberated in that way. But it is this, you know, the one thing you don't want to take away is that you, from this conversation of the book, and I don't think that happens, is that you only need one. You only need one Latinx, you only need one African American, you only need one woman, right? Because we are as diverse as is whatever is the most diverse thing that there is. And if you think about your own family and how within your own family you are different from the rest of them, then such is the case within any given culture as part of that. So you're right, you, you have this weight or you can feel the spotlight that you are somehow the spokesperson <laughs> for all African Americans, all African American women, all Latino, uh, you know, whatever, right, as part of that. And you know, it's just not true. And so even when we're doing something, I try to get those diverse perspectives because I know that my lived experience is not another person, woman of color's lived experience. And we should bring all of that into the conversation. And I don't think there is enough reality, uh, even though we've said it for decades now, the reality that we're, that we're spokespeople. So we're coming to the end. I'm going to ask one more very specific question, and then we're going to turn to maybe some maybe some closing thoughts. Uh, but very relatedly, uh, Jessica in and says, "What do you do when you're asked uh, to be on a panel to speak on diversity?" And I've had this problem too, where you know suddenly I'm supposed to be the expert on diversity. I'm a national security expert. What do I know about women in foreign policy? Or and but what do you? This has happened to all of us. What do you do? How do you handle it? How do you handle it gracefully that basically says, I'm sorry, you know, I'm a, Tyra's an education expert, but uh, Cecilia is an immigration expert, among many other things. What do you do there? Well, one possible strategy is to ask, so why is it that you think that this is my area of expertise, right? To put it back, right? To go back to your strategy, Anne Maria, of asking a question, to turn it back on the person who's asking, who's making it very obvious that they have at least figured out they need a panel on diversity, so points for that, or they've at least figured out that they need some diversity on their panel and points for that. But that doesn't, I mean, I, I think it is okay to reject the notion that because we are the one person of color on the panel that our expertise is actually diversity, that's not the same thing. Okay. So I think it's okay to ask, and I have now made a regular habit of asking, if somebody's asking me to be on a panel of just asking like, um, am I the only person of color on this panel? Like, who else is on this panel? Um, and it, it causes some, frequently causes discomfort, which um, that's fine with me. But it, I, I think it's useful to turn the, the question back on the person who's asking, like, why should the burden be on you to explain, you know, the fact that I have an Enya in my name doesn't mean I'm an expert in diversity. <laughs> Great. Um. All right, so uh, so first of all, I just have to say, uh, Cecilia, I don't know if you saw, uh, but your cousin Jorge wrote uh, in, uh, and I'm not gonna ask it as a question, but I'm gonna make it a comment because he says, tell us about your inner sources of strength when faced with personal attacks. And you, you have talked about that, but I take that um, really is, a comment on your sources of strength. Uh, and all of us have actually witnessed that. Uh, and I'm just grateful that, that he is uh, part of this conversation. But I'm gonna ask you all to reflect uh, in sort of some closing remarks. Autumn McDonald writes in and says, uh, 
also a new American. I'm curious about your thoughts on the nature of power. Frederick Douglass has said that power concedes nothing without demand. If we simplify the current situation uh, to white men have the power and how much tug is needed on our part collectively as women of color, how do you think about that? So we have a quote from Fre Frederick Douglass. Uh, we have a reference to our current uh, situation uh, and a, maybe an invitation just to give us some final thoughts. Tyra, do you wanna go first? <laughs> I won't go first on the final thoughts, but I'll comment on Autumn's point, which I, I think it's very true. If we look at history, the change that we saw in history didn't come from power being given. It came from power being demanded. And part of my fear in this moment we're living in, this moment being over the last few years, is the is the things that we've allowed to go unchecked or we have only spoken about it in our echo chambers, that we've not moved to real action to demand a shift. And there, there are understandable schools of thought around the focus on election, but there's a whole lot that's happened in between here and there that we have let happen and we have not demanded that, that power shift or that things change as part of that. So, I absolutely agree. And when I think about even some of the changes that I have made as a leader, it's come from the demand. Some of it are just things that I saw and observed and I thought were the right things to do, but sometimes it came in response. And I rely on that, that voice, that feedback that says we need to do something differently as part of that. And you could argue that that's giving, but there's a demand that sits there that I, I have to respond to as a leader. I think I agree with all of that. And I, I love that our current Speaker of the House has been very clear about it, that, that you can't expect people to give up power. You have to take it. Yeah. But, then, but then you also have to use it, right? You have to know what you want it for, uh, and, and you have to be prepared to use it. And, one, and to connect that to the, to the question that Jorge asked about kind of sources of strength, one of the pieces of advice I cite in the book is this notion of getting your love at home, yeah. meaning... Um, if you, if you kind of, you know who you are and you know where you belong and you have people in your life that you get sustenance from, then you can go out there and piss people off, um, and demand power and act as an advocate and, and care much less about whether or not those people like you. I don't, I'm not sure Nancy Pelosi worries very much about whether Mitch McConnell likes her. Um, right? She's, a, a, she's an example of somebody who's clearly, she's getting her love at home. She has that stuff at her core that allows her to do uncomfortable things and not really care if that they make people uncomfortable. And that's, um, you know, advice that I've taken to heart when it gets, when things get hard and, you know, things get hard for, for any person in, in, in life. This isn't, this isn't just true of women. It isn't just true of people of color. Um, but this notion that your job when you go out into the world is not about being liked, it's about making a difference. And the, um, if, you, if you know that where you're getting your love from is secure, then it's easier to go out and do it. And people can, you know, say things about you that seem uncomfortable and you don't have to care because you're getting your love at home. So that's a beautiful note uh, on, on which to end. And I will say that I remember early on when I first started to lead, my brother, who was in investment banking, would say to me, you know, it's not personal. And I, I do think many women in particular are more inclined to take criticism personally, where we're socialized to be hypersensitive. And his point was, yeah, you know, people are going to say nasty things, but it's not personal. It's more like a football game or, you know, where you're just in the scrum. Don't assume that it's aimed at you. And, and that was that was helpful to me. And I also I think it obviously does help if you're, you're anchored uh, as securely as possible. Uh, but I want to close by by suggesting to everybody again, I'm not suggesting go buy this book. It's a great book. Uh, it, it is. It was my honor to read it in draft. It was, you know, Cecilia being Cecilia kept saying, oh, you know, you're making time. I can't believe it. I'm like, no, this is a great read. I am learning things. It is funny. 
it is tender, it is fierce in places. Um, it's a book that is a wonderful read and I really do want to end by saying I think it's a book for our time. I think we are in a crisis that demands many different kinds of leadership. We're in a crisis that demands care and kindness and connection and solidarity. We're in a crisis that requires that we draw on the talents of everyone. Uh, and that means all Americans, uh, that means people of color, that means women, that means women of color, and we are grateful for this book. So I thank all of you uh, for being part of this Cocktails in Conversation. Go get the book, tweet about it, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again.